And Susan, as more details are revealed in this disturbing case, the intrigue just deepens. We now know of at least two people who have been questioned by authorities and both of their attorneys insisting they had no involvement in this crime. Hello everyone, my name is Kevin and thanks for stopping by. Here at Just Thought Lounge, we like to take a look at engaging cases that hopefully raise a few thought-provoking questions. Today's case certainly does that. 33-year-old Rachel Del Tondo was killed outside her home in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania on the 13th of May, 2018. As of the publication of this video, her case remains open and the investigation is still active. Officially, no one has been named a person of interest. Depending on how you look at it, however, there are either multiple suspects in this case or the official narrative that there are no suspects at all. Part of what stands out about this case is how all of those involved are interconnected. In this relatively small town, everyone seems to know everyone, which confuses the picture of what happened here quite a bit. You'll see what I mean. Without further delay, this is the tragic and messy story of Rachel Del Tondo. Aliquippa is a relatively small-sized town with a population of under 10,000 residents. It's been described as a town built on steel but sustained through football. Built around the once profitable steel industry, Aliquippa has seen a decline in its prosperity over the last few decades. Where it has excelled is in two very distinct areas, producing pro-American football players through their renowned high school program and at registering extremely high crime rates. Statistics for violent crime in the area are so high that they rival the largest cities in America and not just on a relative scale. But the neighborhood in Aliquippa where Rachel grew up was a family area. It was mostly quiet. Rachel was an elementary school teacher at the Pennsylvania Cyber Charter School in Midland, which is near her home in Aliquippa. Rachel has been described as poised and charismatic with a big heart, and she absolutely loved children. At the age of 33, she still lived with her parents, Lisa and Joe. They were a traditional Italian family and household. As such, Rachel didn't think that she should move out until she was married. This arrangement was agreeable to everyone. Rachel had a great relationship with her parents and was exceptionally close with her mother. In 2016, it looks like Rachel was set to make the move from her parents' home after all. Her longtime boyfriend, successful local businessman, Frank Catropa, flew her off to Paris and proposed marriage. Rachel accepted and began planning an extensive and beautiful Italian wedding. Plans appeared to be moving along at a clip. Rachel had placed a down payment on a nearly $10,000 designer wedding dress, purchased $3,000 shoes, and locations for the ceremony and receptions were scoped and deposits made. Then, Frank asked Rachel for a prenuptial agreement. At this point, plans came to an abrupt halt. Frank says at first, Rachel did not mind the idea that much. It was her parents, he said, particularly her mother, that took offense and found it unacceptable. Rachel's mind had been turned, and she refused to sign any agreement. The two did not officially end their relationship, however, but they did begin to backpedal on the wedding plans. Rachel and her mother became embroiled in a very public spat with the dress designer over their deposit. A nasty back and forth ensued. Lisa utilized the local press to publicly shame the designer's policy and pressure them into providing a refund. The tactic worked. The Del Tondos eventually received the money back, and Frank cancelled everything else. Although the wedding was set aside, the two thought that they might get back together, but time would tell. They continued talking and spending time together. There was one incident that had been bothering Frank, however, and he felt that he needed to first resolve his doubts about it before considering a full reconciliation with Rachel. In February 2016, police found Rachel and Aliquippa senior high school student Sheldon Jeter Jr., who was 17 years old at the time, in a steamed-up car parked in an otherwise empty lot at almost 2 a.m. in the morning. Rachel told Officer Kenneth Watkins that they were just talking. There was nothing inappropriate going on at all. Sheldon had been upset and she was helping him out. That's it. She also asked if the officers, whom she and Frank knew personally, could please refrain from telling her fiancé what had happened because if he found out, he would be mad at her. It did not look good, but the officers accepted Rachel's explanation, they drove Sheldon home, and no charges were filed. Perhaps not surprisingly, Rachel did not fess up to Frank about the help that she was providing to Sheldon. He found out about the incident secondhand from a mutual friend. Rachel insisted the situation was completely innocent, so for a time at least, Frank accepted this and the two continued to see each other. Sheldon, however, did not appear to get the memo. 
he seemed to believe his relationship with Rachel was not entirely innocent. According to Lisa Del Tondo, Sheldon was overly emotional and confused. In an illustrative example, Sheldon turned up at the Del Tondo residence one day unannounced and intoxicated, insisting he see Rachel. When told that Rachel could not see him, he banged on every window in the house before leaving. Lisa used an air gun to frighten him away. In October 2017, Frank decided to get to the bottom of the issue. Turning up at the Aliquippa Police Department, he requested to see the officer's report from that night detailing what they had seen between Rachel and the team. A formal approval process and request is required to obtain these types of police records. Accounts from the Aliquippa police on that day vary regarding who in the department allowed Frank access to the paperwork. The assistant chief, Percival, claimed Chief Couch was close friends with Frank. It's Frankie, just give it to him, he says. Regardless, no formal request was made, but Frank left the station that day with the documents. And he was visibly upset. The version of events set out in the report did not align with Rachel's version. Apparently she told Frank that they were discovered much earlier in the night, not 2am for one. And they were not in a parking lot of a store retailer, but an abandoned lot of an old hospital much farther out. To add to the confusion, the report was not written directly following the incident. It was written more than a year later. Despite police insistence that they found no crime had taken place and no charges needed to be made, they, for some inexplicable reason, decided more than a year later that the encounter needed to be documented. Frank and Rachel do not reconcile, and any hope of restarting wedding plans is lost. But this becomes the least of Rachel's issues. Only a few days after Frank received the documents in November 2017, the report detailing, if nothing else, her very poor judgment is leaked across the town. Emails and text messages from blocked and unknown phone numbers send the report to the mayor, to the news media, and directly to Rachel's friends. The cyber charter school where Rachel worked is also a recipient. She is suspended from her job. The Del Tondos believe that Frank was the source of this leak. Frank denies it. Attorney David Lozier called a personal vendetta. As you all probably know, there was a family, uh, some family members that, that were angry at her over some personal issues. The district attorney called this a personal vendetta. Was he referring to your client? He was not. He was not. Katropa and his attorney addressed the matter, saying the breakup with Del Tondo had nothing to do with Jeter, and Katropa knows nothing about the murder. We wanted to be very, very clear publicly that uh, Frank Katropa has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with what happened. Rachel began to see her life fall apart. Her relationship with Frank was forever ruined. Many of her friendships crumbled alongside her reputation, and her career was crushed. She sought professional help to make it through her mental struggles. While Rachel battled to cope, her mother became proactive. Just as she had sought out a local reporter to force the wedding dress designer into a refund, she seeks out another investigative reporter to take aim at the Aliquippa Police Department and others in the town. Lisa claimed that mountains of corruption were at work within the police department in league with other players, including one local businessman, Frank Katropa. The exact accusations against Frank are uncertain, but in December 2017, the state police do step in to launch a formal investigation of the Aliquippa police following the leak. Rachel Del Tondo agreed to be a cooperating witness and speaks with the state police. In February 2018, an unnamed member of the police department was reprimanded for the leak and that official investigation closed. However, in early March, search warrants for municipal buildings in Aliquippa were issued by state police as part of a wider investigation into the city. The leak investigation may have ended, but a larger investigation into the city was only beginning. Rachel remained a witness and was queued up to testify about what she knew of the city corruption, particularly the Aliquippa Police Department. Rachel told family members as well as the investigative reporter that she thought she was being followed by the police. Her mother says she was deathly afraid of the police after receiving death threats. Rachel received one text to her phone that told her that she would not live to see the end of 2018. Her aunt has also confirmed publicly that Rachel told her of these threats, but says that she now regrets saying anything. The day that Rachel was killed was Mother's Day in the US, the 13th of May, 2018. Rachel was out with her friend Lauren Watkins, a 17-year-old who was an ex-student of hers. The two had since grown close. They had driven around town a bit chatting and then decided to go to Hank's Frozen Custard to grab some ice cream. They texted a mutual friend, Tyree Jeter, to see if he was interested in joining. 
The pair stopped off at Rachel's house very briefly so that she could pick up a sweatshirt. Rachel told her mother that they were going to Hank's and said goodbye. They picked up Tyree on the way over. It was about 10.40 p.m. when Lauren and Tyree returned Rachel to her house. Lauren watched while Rachel reached the side door to the house, opened the door, and then they pulled out of the drive and left. Just inside the door of the house, only a few feet away, sat Rachel's father, Joe, in his usual evening spot, a chair within a few feet of the door. He does not hear his daughter approach, and he does not hear anyone open the door. Less than five minutes later, neighbors reported hearing at least six gunshots ring out across the otherwise quiet neighborhood. Rachel died at the scene, shot several times. She was just outside her parents' home on the drive. One police officer, Kenneth Watkins, is turned away from the scene when he arrives. Officer Watkins had been one of the two policemen who had discovered Rachel in the car with her young student two years before, but he was also a close friend of the Del Tondos and Lauren's father. He was placed on critical instant leave and removed from the case. Reports would emerge later that a private letter was sent by another Aliquippa police officer accusing Officer Watkins of contaminating the scene. No further information was made available on this point. The chief of police at the time said it was an internal matter, and the county district attorney insists there is nothing there. Theories of what happened to Rachel that night were mixed with rumors both in Aliquippa and the broader news media. So just kind of on a cursory level, because we don't know anything really, something just sounds strange to all of this. Yeah, the backstories are the strange part of this whole particular case. And, and as a criminal investigator, and as all criminal investigators, we don't believe in any coincidences whatsoever. So all this, all these backstories will be looked at to see if there's any connection to the crime. Now, the interesting thing I find is that six to 12 rounds being mm. fired um, somewhere in that vicinity indicates to me that it's sort of a semi-automatic handgun or rifle. If it's a handgun, then that, that means to me that they unloaded the whole clip the whole magazine every round in the magazine into into Rachel which which is sort of an overkill shooting here which could indicate that there's a personal issue going on here and that the perpetrator knew Rachel um, uh, when the crime was committed so right. I'm sure law enforcement is looking at all this and also the indication that they're tight-lipped just means to me that they, they they have some very good leads that they're tracking down right now well, wouldn't it also be potentially a murder for hire that someone shows up it with some automatic be. weapon? Yeah. Yes. On a Initial assessments by the department determined that it was a crime of passion, that Rachel was perhaps lured from the door by someone that she knew, perhaps someone that she trusted, and then surprised by the attack. It had happened quickly and at close range. Attention immediately turns to Sheldon Jeter. Sheldon was a bit of a hometown hotshot, a star football player with the high school team in a town that produces disproportionate number of pro athletes. Rachel had met him years earlier when he was in elementary school and struck up her friendship with him much later. Lauren Watkins reported that Sheldon had been extremely interested in her and Rachel's movements the night of the shooting. Lisa Del Tondo says that Sheldon, now 20 years old, remained obsessive over Rachel. The morning after Mother's Day, police arrive at Sheldon's apartment with a search warrant. He is reportedly emotionless when he is told of her death. They seize his cell phone, believing that Sheldon sent texts to his brother, Tyree Jeter, who was with Rachel that night. These texts indicate that Sheldon was both very interested in their whereabouts and appeared to be tracking them that evening. First off, Sheldon messaged Lauren to ask if he had just seen the two women driving around. Between 10 p.m. and 10.30, he sends Tyree four messages. At 10.07, he messages, is y'all there already? Eight minutes later, I got left, huh? Followed by some smiley face emojis. Four minutes after that, who all you with? Then at 10.30, clearly aware of what the group's plans were, he says, Hank's closed. Rachel is dropped off at home about 10 minutes later. Rachel's current boyfriend is also questioned by police. Rashawn Bolton is the older half-brother of both Sheldon and Tyree. He had been in a relationship with Rachel for six months and was well-liked by her parents. Rashawn was out of town on Mother's Day. He would tell police a similar narrative about Sheldon. His younger brother appeared jealous and possessive of Rachel, which had led him to at least once question what the nature of their relationship had been. He was never able to receive a clear answer. The most recent piece of information is an interview between police and this man, Rashawn Bolton, the older brother of Sheldon. 
According to the Warren, Rashawn told police he was in a serious relationship with the victim since December 2017. He told police about an altercation from three months ago when he and the victim were outside of his home. His younger brother Sheldon showed up and reportedly said that expletive told me she was with Amy and then said to her, if my brother wasn't here, I'd expletive you up. Three days later, police returned to Sheldon's home with a second search warrant, which says police were looking for a 9mm gun and any other firearms, ammunition, a hoodie, bloodstained clothing, written correspondence about or to Rachel, notebooks, cell phones, and computers. Police found no weapons or ammo and seized only a few notebooks. Sheldon also voluntarily handed over clothing he was wearing on Mother's Day, although police paperwork indicates surveillance video from an unknown location on that day shows he was actually wearing different clothing. Police also spoke with Lauren Watkins, of course. There are two aspects of Lauren's account that raise some eyebrows but do not seem to be weighing heavily on the investigation. First, Lauren says she did not separate from Rachel all evening, but she did send her a text at one point that read, Go for a walk, I'll come pick you up after. This text was reportedly sent only minutes before dropping Rachel off at her home, shortly before she was killed. Lauren claimed later that she wanted a chance to lose Tyree from the group so that the two could, like, talk and gossip and stuff like that. There are some who question why you would text the person that you are sitting next to in a car, but this could have just been a teenager's logic at work and nothing more. The second curiosity lies in her account of watching Rachel not only reach the side door, but that she also opened it. She later said she went for the screen door, but did not fully open it. Joe Del Tondo says there is no way the door was opened in those few minutes without him being aware of it, given his position only a few feet away inside. So far, attorneys for former fiancé Frank Catropa and sometime boyfriend Sheldon Jeter say their clients deny any involvement in Rachel Del Tondo's murder. But yesterday, Jeter's attorney raised a third possibility, saying Del Tondo had received death threats because she was about to testify before a grand jury about corruption in Aliquippa. It's hard to imagine that that fear and those death threats had nothing to do with the fact that she was shot, you know, within days of her alleged testimony in front of a grand jury. The police do not make any arrests. In the first month of the investigation, they face a series of distractions. First, on the 6th of June, 2018, Chief Don Couch was placed on administrative leave with pay. The city solicitor said this was due to personal issues and did not relate to the murder investigation. He is succeeded by Assistant Chief Percival, whom we have already met. Chief Percival lasts two days. On the 8th of June, he is charged with distributing explicit material, a video apparently, to a 17-year-old girl. He claims this was done in error. The girl in question? Lauren Watkins. Captain Robert Sealock took over as acting chief and, by extension, the ongoing murder investigation. He was the third person to hold the role inside of one week. Well, I just spoke to the new chief. He's the third Aliquippa chief in a week or so. He says he understands the conflict, he understands the controversy, he says that's the very reason why he's pulling his department out of this investigation. He says, look Marty, it's just the right thing to do. Officials said that the coronavirus pandemic placed an unavoidable hold on the investigation as all the agencies that had become involved could no longer properly coordinate in person. By this time, both the FBI and ATF had been pulled in by the Beaver County detectives. Despite the slowdown, local press began reporting in May of 2021 that a grand jury was hearing evidence for a potential indictment in the case. Now for the past 18 months, a state investigating grand jury has been weighing all the evidence in the murder of Rachel Del Tondo. That grand jury is wrapping up and is soon expected to recommend criminal homicide charges be filed in that case. Focused primarily on Sheldon Jeter. So what has Sheldon been up to? A former Aliquippa football star is sitting behind bars here tonight after state police charged him in the shooting death of another Aliquippa man. On Friday the 5th of May 2020, almost exactly two years after Rachel's death, Sheldon is seen on security cameras leaving his home with Tyreek Pugh, a friend and roommate that was considered family. The two had been together earlier in the evening and they were going out to get some ice cream. Just before midnight, officers were sent to Keel Street in Aliquippa following a report of a man lying in the road. There, they found Tyreek, who had been shot multiple times. 
Surveillance footage and cell phone tracking did not align with the story provided by Sheldon. A search found a matching pistol and ammunition in Sheldon's possession. Sheldon denied any involvement. The case went to trial in July 2021. There was not a lot of ambiguity in this case. He was caught on camera with Tyreek, his cell phone placed him at the scene, and the forensics matched items found in the search. Sheldon was convicted of first-degree murder. When the jury's verdict was handed down for the murder of Tyreek Pugh, some people from the town that had not been attending the earlier portions of the trial turned up to hear the verdict read. One of these people looked to the jury box and recognized one of the individuals sitting there. A neighbor of Rachel Del Tondo's, juror number three, lived only a few doors down from her. Not only that, she was married to one of Sheldon's relatives, and in the process of divorcing said relative. Sheldon's lawyers immediately sought a mistrial. The defense motion for a hearing to seek a mistrial based on the juror number three's close ties to the case were denied. The judge said it wasn't grounds for a mistrial, but also that there was overwhelming evidence that Sheldon is guilty. Sheldon was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It is the maximum sentence for first-degree murder under state guidelines. The last news of a potential indictment for Rachel's case was in May 2021, and so far, no charges have been made and no suspects have been formally named. Thanks once again for joining me here today. What do you think of this messy case? And what about the fact that Sheldon was convicted of a separate murder just a couple years later? Let me know your thoughts. I'm Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one. So do you know who killed your mother and father? Or you, your father and... No, I, I really don't. I, I don't know who would want to.